is dangerous teaching and it's wrong and we must reject it. It doesn't matter if an angel from heaven says this or a man in a white cassock at the Vatican says it, we must reject it. Now, wait a minute. Francis is at war with the traditional liturgy and mass. He's at war with the faith and at war with the gospel. But remember, according to Michael Matt and all of these people, Francis is also still the infallible, indefectible supreme teacher of all Christians. He is the living embodiment of Peter and Christ as the successor to Peter, the vicar of Christ, uh, and has the charism of the Holy Spirit. Would you, tr would you leave Francis in a classroom without you there to teach you and other children the tenets of Catholicism? I would not. Francis doesn't tell anybody about the gospel and he doesn't tell people they need to convert to Christ, which is true, but now wait a minute. So, but this is the supreme teacher of all Christians. This is not just a, a priest or some random lay Catholic person failing to do their duty. This is the supreme pastor of all Christians. Well, people are saying Ben XVI is still the Pope. Could be the case. People are saying Francis never was the Pope. Could be the case. He certainly seems to lack the charism of the Vicar of Christ. He doesn't like the title Vicar of Christ. People say in the comments, well, the election in 2013 was invalid. People say Bennett XVI was still the Pope. Some people say he was elected validly, but because of his heresy, because he never answered the dubia of Cardinal Burke and Brown Muller and others, he fell from the papacy and lost the charism of St. Peter's keys. You know, Vatican I is pretty clear on the extent, the authority, the supremacy, the unquestionable nature of what the Roman See teaches and also its indefectibility. Uh, I don't see how after Vatican I you could conceivably argue that the Pope could err on natural law. I mean, this is ludicrous. Uh, much less in terms of the, well, if, if you can't err in theology, a fortiori, he can't err in natural law. Robert Bellarmine says when a man, a Pope is a manifest heretic, he falls ipso facto immediately from the papacy. See, Vatican I is very clear about the nature of the church, its indefectibility, the office of Peter being re uh, remaining in the church t until the return of Christ, not just until some vague end of the world where, oh, we're going to have 70, 80, 100, 200 years of no Pope. No, no, no. The office of Peter, which is not just an ethereal, invisible church that you sign up for online through email, the office of Peter, meaning the successors to Peter in the actual Roman see until the coming of Christ. What this feels like is an NGO. It feels like an arm of the UN. It feels like a communist takeover of the Catholic church. It's taking the buildings and the robes and the vestments and the language and the look and the feel of Catholicism, but it's using it to promote a secular agenda, an agenda aligned with the UN in America, an agenda aligned with the Democratic Party. The Vatican II documents and John Courtney Murray are telling you that the church in their new conception should not have any influence or thing to say to the secular state. Okay, so if we went with that and we should have the, you know, desacralization of the civil sphere, of the social sphere, if we should have then purely secular states, then why are they turning around and saying, oh, but we do need to set up international bodies to police the world and the Pope can tell you what you should do in your nation states morally. You see what I'm you see the contradiction here? It went from the church the church has nothing to say to the state to now you're going to have to submit to a global government. Pope Francis could have a massive conversion, please God. Uh and please God. Tradition excommunicated, which is a study on canon law from the SSPX, is a bunch of different writers. And I, I ironically pulled this out. I noticed that there's this little uh, card here in it, which is a card calling for Rome <laughs> to
to pray pray for the canonization of Archbishop Lefebvre. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys, I'm pretty sure Frank is not gonna <laughs> Frank is not gonna canonize Archbishop Lefebvre. So that's a uh, fool's hope there, fool's errand. But the point being is that it is not the prerogative of the SSPX or its bishops or its canon lawyers to tell Rome what tradition is or that Rome has excommunicated tradition. So the very title of this book, which is about arguing that Rome has excommunicated tradition, means that Rome has defected. This is the de facto position then of the SSPX, even though they don't admit it. They're admitting that Rome has defected. Well, if Rome has defected, then Rome is not what Vatican I says, because Vatican I, clear as day, teaches that the Roman See cannot defect. And the Roman See and its pontiff are the interpreters of tradition. So there's no getting around this stuff by things like, well, I'm only going to accept um, the traditional popes. I'm not going to accept the present popes because the, the office of the, the papacy is different from the occupant of the papacy. Okay, yeah, there is a distinction between the office and the occupant, but the office has the power that it has when there's an occupant. And you cannot do a Nestorian ecclesiology and separate the holder of the office from the office. And this is the mistake that a lot of the trads fall into where they adopt a, a quasi-Nestorian doctrine of the papacy where they're only bound to this ethereal form of the papacy, but not the actual holder of the papacy. That's preposterous. And Vatican yeah, I, the, the Vatican I, by the way, condemns that. Vatican I condemns that. I, I saw this beautiful woman. She had blonde hair. She was perfect. No wrinkles, no spots. And I immediately discerned that this was Holy Mother of the Church. And she was writhing in pain. She was in a bed, and there's sheets on her, and she was very sick. And I noticed that her breasts were engorged with milk. <laughs> Now, you trads, I mean, this is gold. I couldn't have asked for something better. You trads, you guys have attacked me incessantly. You've gone ape over me. You have done, said everything. And I'm not mad. I forgive you guys, okay? I don't, I'm not worried about it because I know what it's like to be a trad, okay? And I'm going to be honest. I didn't want to forgive you guys, but I have to. I have to make myself because Christ tells us we have to, right? But look. You guys have attacked me. I told you that this guy was wrong and he won't debate because he knows that we would floor him when it comes to Thomism, when it comes to divine simplicity, when it comes to these issues, right? And when I would bring this up for months and months on Twitter, I would constantly try to talk. I would say, you know, let's do this. Let's do it. No, what does he do? He blocks me, right? And now what's happened? What? Within a few months after this blocking, what does he do? He comes and does this car video of this ridiculous claim to this mystical vision of engorged milkers. Let's play this again. Beautiful woman. She had blonde hair. She was perfect. No wrinkles, no spots. And I immediately discerned that this was Holy Mother of the Church. And she was writhing in pain. She was in a bed and there's sheets on her and she was very sick. And I noticed that her breasts were engorged with milk, tons of milk. And I mean, you know what? If you guys think that is a valid approach, if you want to that, then you get what you deserve. You see, I mean, to follow this over what we have in orthodoxy is just sad. I feel sorry for you guys. And all you have to do, look, it's okay to be wrong. Okay. I've been wrong many, many times. It's not the end of the world to be wrong about something, right? I was raised Protestant. I came to eventually see that I just, it's just not right. I tried to defend it, right? It's okay to be wrong. I got into Roman Catholicism. I lived it, breathed it, took it so serious. I mean, I was super committed to this stuff, right? It wasn't like, oh, it's just a, you know, cultural thing. I'll pretend. Dude, I mean, I've read Denzinger twice. Nobody, nobody does that. Okay? Unless they're serious about their Catholicism. People don't just sit down and read through 800-page books about Catholic dogma. You don't get so serious that you're going to the Latin Mass for years and years and years if you're not taking this serious. So I, I get it, dude. I understand 
the modus operandi, the mindset. But this is embarrassing. And it's not just embarrassing because, oh, it's some kind of rivalry with Taylor. I don't follow Taylor Marshall. I don't keep up with the trad drama. I haven't kept up with that in at least a decade. I left all of that stuff. I haven't been back. Don't miss it at all. I have no interest in any of that stuff, although I will debate Roman Catholics. But it's illustrative. That's the point here. It's illustrative that it's the exact same issue that you saw with Taylor Marshall. I'm excuse with uh, Matt Slick and the, the debate with Dr. Ananias, right? What is the foundation really of these positions? Is it really all of this highfalutin philosophy and dogmatics and magisterium and councils and all? Or is it really the subjective desire and experience and the impetus to want to ratify what is your own position? As Father Deacon Dr. Ananias said it really well, I think it describes adequately the Roman Catholic perception, which is, and, and you could say the same thing for Calvinism. Are we not, I'm speaking as a Roman Catholic or a Calvinist, formerly being one, are we not really just defending an idea? I mean, are you not really just worshiping your idea of God? I never really thought about that when I was a Roman Catholic. It wasn't until I heard, you know, Orthodox critiques where I started thinking that, you know, my idea is not a correspondence to who God is or what God is. Right? They don't match up. And I know that in theory, Roman Catholics confess via negativa. And I, I know they confess that. And I know in some sense, Calvinists would confess that unless they were like a Clarkian or something. I mean, they actually think that our ideas are uh, like literally synonymous with propositions in God's mind so but there is a process and if you go watch Father Peter Hears' uh, talk that he did that's really good on heterodoxy it's the talk that he did about a month ago on the Holy Fathers I highly recommend this talk because the all of the issues that we're talking about here today with Calvinists or with the Roman Catholics the Thomas none of it can be settled through uh, factual propositions debate and analysis now you, you may think that sounds weird what why would you do apologetics and discuss and debate if it can't be settled because ultimately it's not an issue that's intellectual the reason that it's not is because it, it can be right but what i'm saying is that it can't be reduced to that right so yes god can use argumentation he can use good arguments to persuade people but the issues at hand here are not propositional, rational problems. They're problems that man in his heart has. And the whole basis of both the Calvinist, Protestant, Augustinian, slash Thomistic, Roman Catholic approach, by the way, it's not actually, actually Augustine's view of illumination is closer to our view, but setting aside that, uh, the Roman Catholic perception of how we know God and the Calvinist conception or Protestant conception of how we know God are themselves both propositional and based on created grace. So you see, the system has already determined from the outset the limitations and possibilities of knowing God. This is why St. Gregory Palamas says that if you go with Barleum's presuppositions, it leads to atheism. You will end up atheist. I'm not saying that necessarily every person ends up atheist he's saying that if you followed it out to its consistent logical conclusion you would end up atheist and that's because again the, the system has determined from the outset that you don't actually directly know the god that you're proclaiming to believe in teach about dogmatize about you you know created effects you never have the direct experience of his uncreated energies at least not in this life. But doesn't that really beg the question? And then how do you know God? I mean, this is really the whole entirety of the argument throughout the debate, the dialogue with the barley mite, right between Palomas and Akindinos. That's where it leads. I mean, this is really just rehashed what Dr. Bradshaw says in Aristotle East and West, right? If we take all of these assumptions, Actus Purus, all of the... Uh, 
Aristotelian uh, movement of eternal matter, unactualized actualizer type of stuff that you see in Phaser and that you see in every Thomist that I've ever heard of, or the, the Roman Catholic doctrine of divine simplicity, then we're left with an unknowable, uh, unsaving knowledge of God. 